Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. The Reliable Plant Conference and Exhibition is happening June 3rd through June 6th, 2024 in Chicago, Illinois. Secure your 10% discount by visiting conference.reliableplant.com. Click on register now and enter the code CMMS. All right. Thanks for tuning in today. We have Sean Eisenhower of Iriducio returning to CMMS radio to help us dispel some myths and have a little fun chopping it up about maintenance management, maintenance and reliability. We're going to mix in a little CMMS and much more. I met Sean at the Reliable Plant and Machinery Lubrication Conference and exhibit in Orlando. This was this past August. We did a sit-down interview. It was audio only. We mixed in some video elements for that. So go find that episode and check it out. But this was, you know, around a lot of the concepts that he presented in Mountain Man Wisdom. And I love that presentation. We got to sit down and chop it up. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. Sean, welcome back to CMMS Radio. Good to be here, Greg. It's, it's always fun for me when I get to interact with you because I love having true bona fide industry experts that have been there, done that, and they keep doing that, helping people kind of improve all different aspects of their operation. So I've got some notes about misunderstood terms in the world of maintenance management, whether it's CMMS or not, maintenance and reliability, and we want to dispel a myth or two if we can, you know, things like magic bullets and easy buttons and so on, the stuff that doesn't really exist. Um, Absolutely. I want to ask you right out of the gate, what are three acronyms and or buzzwords that are are either misunderstood or misused? Yeah, so I appreciate it again having me on. It's always fun to get out and talk about these things. You guys know that that we're pretty passionate about reliability, maintenance, and asset management. But, you know, as you get into some of the ones that I see very, very regularly misused, um, some of them are are quite simple. The difference between planning and scheduling, uh, as an example. Um, A lot of folks, when we're doing an assessment or we're spending some time with someone working through their maturity level in the... uh, the the various parts of maintenance and reliability, you know, we'll ask the question, how much of your work is planned? And we'll get the answer. Well, you know, 80% is planned. Well, immediately I know, hmm, that doesn't sound right. Uh, Because I've seen the organization and I've seen some of the the maturity cues that are coming from other other parts of of the uh, process. And there's no way you're getting enough work to plan and schedule 80%. So then as we dig a little deeper, We find out that it well, it's not planned, it's scheduled, or it's PM work that has been scheduled. Um, The PM work wasn't necessarily planned. Um, So to 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 define those two the way we think about it, you know, planning is going to be all about what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, not when we're going to do it. And scheduling is simply about when we're going to do it. And um, that matters because, you know, when a job is planned and then scheduled, it's five to seven times less expensive to execute that work. Whereas if I'm just scheduling work and the job plan says go replace the motor or go replace the pump, then I'm going to have more built-in waste. I'm going to have other issues that affect the performance of the organization. So those, I think that's the first two that I would say is the difference between planned and scheduled work and the fact that they are different. And you know, Greg, something that's, that's kind of interesting about that one specifically is it doesn't matter whether you're talking about in the U.S. or you're talking about globally, that confusion around those two terms goes pretty much everywhere. It's interesting that you mentioned that because lately I've been doing some episodes where we're exploring cultural differences. Now, I'm not talking about the maintenance culture and, you know, kind of the mindset and the culture of the organization itself, but how regionally there's some differentiation. In fact, a lot of differentiation about what gets people motivated, 
why they are willing to versus unwilling to adopt certain changes and change management. So a lot of this kind of revolves around that, not just the global cultural differences, but when we're building a culture of, let's say, excellence, maintenance excellence or operational excellence within teams, there's a lot that has to be done to connect what the team really does to what the organization really does. And they're doing it from different vantage points, but they do need alignment. So one of the things I had written down uh, was around maintenance. This was one of the terms that I've recently, and especially over the last year now doing the podcast, learning from you and a lot of other people that I have on, maintenance is often a misunderstood term because people think maintenance is about fixing things. Is that a misconception? Well, I think you got to, you really have to define those terms um, pretty, pretty shortly coming out of the gate, right? Because, you know, maintenance is about keeping it in a standard condition. Um, that does not mean that everything that is restorative is maintenance. It also does not mean that everything that is not restorative is not maintenance. And so defining the terms so that you understand how they're being used in the organization, I think is really important uh, before you get too far into it. Um, you know, reliability is, is another one, you know, with the age of asset management and, and more people uh, pursuing some of the ISO 55,000 type approaches to asset management, again, you have to define reliability as well. Um, and what is going to be reliability within your organization? What is going to be within the maintenance subset? And I describe it as a subset in some parts of the world. I can tell you that they don't describe it as a subset. Uh, so when you get into some of the cultural aspects of the way words that you know, we use like maintenance and reliability. Uh, reliability doesn't see as much global usage as maintenance does. Um, but asset management is gaining space. But then here's asset management that means so much more than just maintenance and reliability. It includes things like intellectual property. It includes risk management, mitigation, you know, so you really have to, I think, figure out, you know, what do you, what does your organization want these words to mean for them and make sure that everyone's on the same page. I'm curious about, so when you, when you engage with a client, whether they're coming in to, for example, maybe, maybe they want to do something with the unique IBL program that you have, or they want to bring you in to consult to solve a specific problem or a set of specific problems within their organization because they want to discover and implement more efficiencies or eliminate or I even identify and exploit maybe even a bottleneck or something to that effect in production and overall production. Do you find that a lot of these terms that we're talking about today, the reason there's a lot of misconception or misapplication, misuse of those terms is because they really change once you're in the actual environment, even if it's two identical industries, but the environment itself heavily influences how you're going to utilize and what that term really means. Is that kind of a fair way to say you encounter that every time? I, I, I think so. There are some words that I think have just taken on different definitions over the years. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Reliability-centered maintenance, that's one that RCM is used in two ways. The, the more traditional definition, arguably, is the tool that you use to develop a maintenance strategy or an equipment maintenance plan for an asset, right? But there are also organizations, and I won't, I won't name them, but there are organizations that use RCM as more so the, the phrase that means reliability improvement. So they will call it their RCM initiative. And they're, they're talking about everything that some other organizations would say is reliability improvement, but they call it RCM. So, you know, I think that's one of those that we definitely see on a regular basis that has two definitions and you've got to ask some questions. Um, TPM, total productive maintenance, another example Depending on who you talk to, that could be anything from traditional autonomous maintenance or operator care 
or it could be the more traditional Japanese answer that actually looks more like what I defined as reliability improvement a few minutes ago. So, you know, I think that's one of the exercises that I try to do very early on when I sit down with a client is to try to understand when they say TPM or RCM or autonomous maintenance, what do they mean? What does that look like within the confines of their organization? So in, in that regard, that's more about, say, for example, you're in the midst of the discovery process with this potential client. Maybe it's an existing client, but they've got a new project getting them in a position where they can articulate what they, what they think or suspect is what they're trying to do so that you can further understand that and then deliver a solution that accomplishes that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, you mentioned our IBL products, our blended learning products, you know, we, we develop those with this in mind. And, you know, one of the things if, as a student goes through that, that six month or, or one year process, depending on the flavor that they're going through they go through modules and those modules are not the same for everybody, you know, based on certain things that you say or certain answers you give in the module, it may give you a longer path or a shorter path. So it's judging your maturity, if you will, a little bit as you go through the process. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is because we found that we had to take everyone through some of the basic processes and some of the basic vocabulary or they would come out the other side and be talking about two different TPMs or two different RCMs. So, you know, some organizations, they allow people to test out of their uh, curriculum or test out of their material. And I actually found that to be pretty detrimental early on because they may be able to pass the test, but they come out the other side speaking two different languages. So we spend a lot of time in that curriculum uh, base loading good process methodology, base loading definitions of the words. You know, we may talk about the fact that they have different definitions, but here when you hear us say predictive maintenance in these modules, here's what predictive maintenance means, at least from our perspective moving forward. Right. right. And it's always it's it's one of the one of the things that yeah, I don't think we're ever gonna solve it. I think we just have to keep trying to solve it when it comes to what we learn and then what we do with what we learn influences how that actually unfolds in the real world. It's a very different thing because again, getting back to the environment, whether we're talking globally or locally in North America, whatever it might be, that's where when the rubber meets the road, it's not going to be the cookie cutter or what you learned as, as an operational definition of, said thing, you're going to redefine that for that environment because the impacts that you're after are going to be different. So one of the things I want to ask you about is when we look at preventive maintenance, so in my world, preventive maintenance was very generalized. And then we want to utilize these schedules when we compare to break fix environments, how we can improve that, eliminate the breakage and all the running around like herding cats. When we look at preventive maintenance, specifically preventive maintenance, and we talk about manufacturer OEM specs on preventive maintenance schedules, think of a vehicle, right? Every 3,000 miles, you got to change the oil. And that may be true, but that's not always true. It's more often not always true because it uh, depends on the vehicle we're talking about, the environment that it is. So th this would, that it is used in. Would this not be the same in the various environments you go into to affect these changes or outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and while we're talking about PMs and the OEM side of it, I'm going to say something that may be offensive, um, but, but hopefully folks will understand kind of where I'm coming from. And I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking about uh, enough of a population that I can feel very comfortable bringing it up here, right? And that is, you know, when we look at um, OEM, uh, original equipment manufacturer preventive maintenance task, what we find is in general, they're just not that good. They're not that good. And, and so, you know, you ask yourself a question, you know, why do they exist? 
you know, what, what was their thoughts as they went through that process. And what you find many times is there wasn't a lot of thought put into it, or a very junior engineer took the time to develop the preventive maintenance task because the more senior knowledgeable engineer was busy designing the equipment. And so, you know, as the new guy, I'm going to end up working on the preventive maintenance task. Well, I may not understand failure modes and failure mechanisms, right? Which are two more very confused words, right? Um, and so if I don't understand those, then my marching orders may sound like this, Greg, sell a whole lot of parts and get me through the warranty period, right? That's what my boss tells that junior engineer uh, as they're creating this maintenance strategy. And so therefore, they don't have the operator's best interest necessarily in mind. They are looking to, unfortunately, sell parts. And then they have a belief that if they do a lot of preventive maintenance, that'll get them through the warranty period. Now, you and I know something different, right? Because of infant mortality and the fact that when we touch things, we tend to introduce defects, but that's their mentality. That's all they know sometimes. Yeah. And that, that gets all the way back to that environment and the specificity that takes place in how something is used, when something is used and used. And a lot of people, I think sometimes we're moving too fast and that's the real problem, but we know that the reason we would slow down is so that we could later move faster, more efficiently with yep. less. I always say you need to be effective first and efficient second, because if you flip those around and I know some would argue the definitions, but, but if you flip those around, what you end up doing is making a lot more junk faster, right? Um, so I need to, you know, I need to make the organization effective and then I'll go and take away the waste and get the efficiencies and, and drive those sort of things as we go forward. It's amazing how this seems to apply to a hell of a lot more than what we're doing in physical plants, you know, other manufacturing environments, facilities, maintenance, management, even janitorial, but we can apply this to many aspects of life and how we move through the world. It's just really interesting to me how these concepts are both so elementary yet so complex because there's misunderstanding and everybody's looking for these quick fixes. So one of my things, one of the questions I had written down was, uh, does a CMMS do the work for you? Oh, great question. I think a CMMS is the backbone or the, the spinal cord, if you will, that connects all the parts together. Uh, to think that you can just apply a silver bullet solution, I'll go buy some software, seems a little bit crazy to me. Um, because again, you may be speeding up bad maintenance practices which means you don't get the results you expect. And then we look at the CMMS vendor and we tell them your, your software stinks, right? Well, no, their software doesn't stink. Your business processes stink, right? And so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I early on in my career, I implemented a lot of CMMSs. Um, and uh, inside of an organization, I, I got to travel to a lot of their facilities, about 30 or 40 facilities, helping them implement a very early product, one of the old data stream products for those older listeners on the call. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that was, uh, you know, years ago. And, and, and as you look at them, if you don't have the good business processes and you don't have the, the discipline to use the system, the software really doesn't bring a ton of value, uh, unfortunately. Um, there are some studies that were done by MIT in the late 90s that actually kind of suggested some percentages around that. And I do not recall what they were off the top of my head, but I can tell you that what the gist of it was just taking technology and plugging it in had a negative return on investment. Taking, tech, taking just processes and plugging them in, business processes, if you will, without the software, made an improvement, but it wasn't all that phenomenal. It was good, but it wasn't great, right? But what they really noticed was the synergy of AN. They noticed that if you take the processes, you map the processes, and then use them with an enabler like a CMMS or an EAM, then you get something like 78% ROI. 
um, you know, so you get a much better return on investment. So you can go from a negative technology solution to a positive uh, synergies of and both solution and get a lot, lot more out of it. Yeah, one of the things I, I tell people a lot, whether it's in a consulting situation or talking about it on the podcast or whatever, you know, just chatting it up, right? And uh, I've done stuff on LinkedIn where I say, hey, what's the best CMMS? What's the number one CMMS? And ultimately, we arrive at what the actual answer is. It's not a specific product. It's the CMMS that your people will use in the way that it was intended to affect the outcome that you were just talking about where we got to put all those things together. So it's almost as if you could essentially use whatever CMMS and you can find a way to leverage it in the best possible way for your organization, because what's going to matter is that people adopt it, use it in the way that you're actually intentionally using it to get those outcomes. And that ends up involving connecting maintenance to the business as a whole and getting it off the balance sheet being looked at as a cost. That's where you can get these kind of outcomes. So, I'm leading to my next question. Well, before is, you do, before you get to that next question, I got to say a couple things. First of all, I saw your LinkedIn post and I giggled. In fact, I think I just posted a guy holding popcorn and I was just here for the show, right? Yes, yes. Um, but I, the one thing I didn't post on there and something that I've kind of learned over the years that I think is kind of funny, there's no better CMMS than the last CMMS you had. So if, if I sit down and chat with somebody, you know, maybe they've just moved to SAP or, or they've moved to some other platform. One of the first things I hear is how easy or how much better the old system was. Um, and so, you know, I think that's one piece of it as we go forward. And, and I think you're a hundred percent spot on understanding the business objectives. It becomes a tool, right? I don't care if you use snap on tools, craftsman tools, or Harbor freight tools. At the end of the day, you got to decide. What am I willing to spend and what value and expectation do I have? There are times when a Harbor Freight tool is a great choice because I'm going to use it one time and then I'm going to toss it in my toolbox and probably never use it again. Uh, I think of removing O2 sensors, right? I'm probably going to use that tool once every five years. So I'm not going to go buy a $175 snap-on socket to do that. I'm going to go to Harbor Freight. But other tools that I use on a regular basis, and I, I work on cars a lot on weekends, the other, you know, the other side of it is my basic tool set that I use day in and day out is Craftsman. And it's Craftsman because I know it'll hold up to me doing the things that I'm trying to do and getting the job done. So I think, you know, there's a piece of it that says you need to understand your business processes, but there's also that benefits versus cost uh, decision that I've got to make as well, you know, and, and based on how I'm going to be using it. So I didn't mean to, to no. derail you, but that's, you know, that was, that was kind of always been my thoughts around the CMMS side. This, this is exactly why I have kind of a framework and not necessarily a format for the podcast, because I want it to be highly conversational and I want to leave out as much of the fluff and BS as we can. So the, the question I was going to lead into, and this is ideal when it comes to root cause analysis, which I think is a thing that definitely changes. You're going to have a process, a framework for going through that. But I think a lot of these things fall into that realm where organizations and teams haven't done enough of the work ahead of time to know what they actually need to do to be successful with a CMMS, an enterprise asset management solution or otherwise, or when we're talking about these other various tools that we use in the maintenance space to effectively understand more about where are we now? Where are we trying to go? Did we find what's causing our inability to get there? That would be part of an RCA, if if you will. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And I tell people all the time, if you can look at your last CMMS, whether it was successful or it failed and do an RCA on it, you can find a lot of things that you can now preemptively mitigate that risk as you go forward, right? So if you had a really successful implementation of Maximo a few years ago, and now you're going to SAP, look at why you were successful and mimic those things to reduce that risk going forward. Now, on the flip side, if you had a really unsuccessful CMMS implementation, then don't do it again. Let's think about those things. Let's list those out and make sure that we don't do those same things as we go forward. 
Yes. And I would add to that, if I may, that you might not have to change your CMMS platform. You might have to figure out more specifically why that wasn't a pleasant experience. And it might go right back to the beginning. And I tell people that because especially if we're dealing at that level, right? We're talking full-blown enterprise solutions here. And I don't like to call out specific products, but when you're at that level, when you're talking about the Maximos, the SAPs, and there's several others, those are expensive. Those are very, very heavy investments. And it's not just the money that organizations spend on them. It's the time, the effort, the disruption, the times that you could have slowed down an extra three weeks and actually done something much better, but you can't afford to do that because somebody said, or maybe they didn't realize it. So I always want people to be cautious, do a proper assessment of the existing situation and make sure you really know why you're making this change because you might not have to make the change of the software. You might just need to change your processes a little bit. It might look big, but with an expert like yourself, And a proper assessment or someone on their team saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to do a full assessment of this and really put my finger on it. That's going to be far more beneficial than making a change to some solution because it's not going to be a magic bullet. It is not. It doesn't work that way. It's your people. It's your process that I think matter more than anything else, because even with terrible with no technology, post-it notes, stand up meetings and all those things. We know many examples that we can't necessarily say who, but where they have successful maintenance and reliability practices that are implemented in their organization. And that is going to make the difference no matter what technology you have. So (laughs) um, next, I wanted to ask you, and this is something I learned about when, when I met you last year. So talk to me a little bit about the BS flag and why it's so important and when should it be used? Well, I happen to have one of those BS flags here. I keep it on my desk. Uh, it's either here or right behind me, pretty much at all times. Um, and we use it for a couple reasons. And, and BS, for those of you that don't know, this is a very old vintage version. It's been around for about 10 years. Iridisho is 10 years old this year. And so this is one of the first ones that we made. But it basically, uh, our idea was that we needed to be able to challenge things without people getting upset. You know, I think culturally, the U.S. And, and maybe even arguably other areas of the world as well, it's become really hard to talk to people about things when you disagree, right? You know, if you think planning's one thing and I think scheduling something different, I don't have to hate you for it, right? Um, we just have to agree to disagree and move on. And, and we did that with these BS flags. And we say that, you know, the BS doesn't stand for what everybody thinks it is. It stands for beyond sustainable. It stands for boring stuff. It stands for bogus strategy, right? Um, but the idea is that somebody can throw this in a meeting or they can throw this in a training session. We all laugh. And then we have a conversation about why they can't get on board with it. Uh, You know, sometimes it'll be because they're different. Greg, you ever heard that one before? Right. And don't get me wrong. There are times when people are different. Right. But many of what we call the best practices in this industry are not different. Right. Right. Um, and so I, you know, over the years I've been doing this close to 20 years. I think one of these days I should actually figure out how long I've been doing this, but I've been doing this about 20 years. I started in, um, uh, a company called Sunoco implementing CMMSs, as I mentioned earlier, and then, uh, into Exxon Mobil, where I was a reliability engineer and got to work with a team of predictive maintenance technologists. And then, uh, in the consulting world, now I've worked in, oh, I don't know, just, many, many different industries and and different places around the world. And, you know, as you, as you look at that, you're, you're going to run into these, these issues, these, these areas that we don't agree, or I, I don't think this will fit or work in my industry or my plan. Um, And, and we want to have fun with that, you know, throw the flag, tell me that, that I'm wrong and let's discuss it. Because if we don't discuss it, you're going to sit there and stew on it. You're going to sit there and think about it. And when you're doing that, you're not hearing anything else that we say, discuss, 
or try to, to, to figure out from that point forward. So we have a little fun with our flags, but the idea really is get it out there, have the discussion, and then be able to move on to um, you know, the, the topic and, and all be heard, everyone yeah. be, be engaged and heard moving forward. So. Absolutely. And I, 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 I confess right here, wide open, people will see this, that I've made the mistake many times to take the bait, go in adversarial, trying to make a point. And sometimes you just got to let all that go for a second, because at the end of the day, we're all trying to get somewhere and it tends to often be the exact same place. That's right. Especially That's right. in this industry. And there's plenty of people doing it wrong, plenty of people doing it right. And it's okay to call somebody out for doing it wrong, but it's going to be a lot easier if you say, Hey, can I share something that might make that even better what you're doing? And the BS flag seems to give that. It breaks moment. the ice. Yeah. It breaks the ice, right? And then the conversation yeah. can happen. And, you know, I'm going to be talking at Leading Reliability uh, coming up that conference here in a, a couple of, I guess, about two months. Yeah. I'm going to be talking there about when people do the right thing for the wrong reason and it stops them from being able to progress. And talk about some deep held things where we really need to throw the BS flag, right? Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples just to kind of, you know, kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. You know, I, we we have operations managers and maintenance managers that are spending, you know, tons of money organizing the storeroom so that it all the parts are in the right place and all the equipment's grouped together by equipment class and all this sort of stuff. But they're doing it so that they can come to the window when an emergency happens and get the part in less than 30 seconds instead of solving the problem with the equipment so that you don't have to go to the parts room. And then I can reduce the amount of inventory and, and have a, a parts room that is less, uh, less expensive to own. Yeah. Right. So we see a lot of a lot of situations. Predictive maintenance is another one, you know, the five core predictive maintenance tools. We see people applying those only to get better at emergency repairs. So they're using them to say, yep, that's pretty much failed. I'm going to go ahead and just do it tomorrow. And now that five to seven times call savings that I talked about earlier in the podcast, you don't get that because you're still doing an emergency repair. You're also introducing the risk associated with a non-planned repair and the infant mortality that we could very well suffer, right? So this flag comes in handy to kind of get through those things and, and kind of say, look, you know, I know that you have good intentions, but I need you to take off your reactive glasses and put on your proactive glasses, because if you don't, there's going to be a point in the future where you can't get to where you want to go because of how you got here. Yeah. And I think, I think we can all give over pretty damn easily nowadays more than ever to kind of dogmatic thinking where, I don't know, we're missing the forest for the trees or however you like to use that term because critical thinking is, it should be on the endangered species list at this point. In well, my it's, funny that, it's funny that you say the tree example, because I actually had that conversation today. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so I own some property here just outside of Charleston, and it's a it's a farm. It's a basically it's a tree farm with uh, quite a bit of uh, pines and that sort of thing. And this summer it got pretty dry down there, and I'm a little a little hesitant to to, to admit this, but I may have built a campfire. It may not have been contained well enough, and I may have started a small forest fire, right? And, and I'm headed somewhere with this, so, so bear with me. But, you know, what I did initially was what a lot of us do in the maintenance and reliability space. I grabbed some branches and tried to beat the fire out around the trees, you know. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to beat this tree out, and then I'm going to go over here and beat this tree out. Well, I, I couldn't keep up. And it was really taking over and starting to run down this series of trees. And I had to step back, and I had to say, look, I got to quit fighting tree to tree. I have got to go over here and cut a ditch and that ditch will stop the fire. I'm going to give up these trees in order to get time to build that ditch. And I did. And by building that ditch, then the, the fire stopped. But if I had continued to try to go piece by piece, I would have burned down my whole entire property, uh, yeah. which 
arguably, if it ended up okay, it would be a con controlled burn and everything would have been good. But, you know, it also could have gone really pear-shaped. And so my point for sharing that is, though, I, I see that very often where people are so focused on putting out the little fires that they don't step back and see the big picture. And uh, an example of that to kind of take it back to maintenance would be where, you know, I'm putting together a gripe sheet or I'm putting together a list of things that I think don't work well in our maintenance department. And I'm just going to go attack them like a Kaizen event, right? I'm going to go out there and try to fix these individual things. But if I don't understand that in order to fix this thing, I've got to do these three things over here that I can't see because those support this one and make it work. And so, you know, I see a lot of kind of Kaizen type approaches to the maintenance process and they don't get the results they expect because they're missing some of those underlying things that if they had stepped back, they could have seen and they could have realized, hey, I don't have a good hierarchy. And if I don't have a good hierarchy, I can't build bill of materials because I have to have the hierarchy to build the bill of materials. So you can tell me how bad our, our bill of materials is all day, but until we get a good hierarchy, it doesn't matter. I've got to have somewhere to associate those parts. And those that's just an example. But, you know, it's, it's that stepping back and seeing the bigger picture and then proactively looking about how we're going to address it. And, and that, that's so, so common. And everybody's got the best of intentions and they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they're not seeing. And this is why it should be revisited on some frequency uh, going all the way back to what we talked about with ADCAR, the R the reinforcement. And it makes me think all these other things like uh, take a go and see approach, get out there on the floor, see what's really happening. One of the things you were talking about earlier, just scream to me, kidding, full kidding. If you're doing that, you're going to have these great opportunities to, you know, reduce the revenue that you tie up in poorly designed inventory systems and supply room and even tool room, um, and all those types of things. So there's always some work that can be done, but you don't just want to work on something without putting it to the test of how does this impact the whole thing, getting all the way back to the the forest for the trees where you're fighting one tree at a time and you will surely lose it all. Whereas you know, you, you're exactly right. And you reminded me of another acronym that we use or a, a tool we use, and that's 5S. And if you think about it, that's another way to think about, you know, how we go about maintenance and reliability. You know, at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to standardize before I first clean, right? I've got to clean up the area. And so to your example, if I, you know, keep every part in the storeroom, that means every part now has to find a new home, which means I may have to buy, buy more shelving and buy more storage locations and, and all that sort of stuff. And so by cleaning up first, just like 5S teaches us, then I don't have to organize and catalog as many parts as I would have the other way. Just lot, lots of opportunities in this whole big space and world that we're talking about and touching upon and that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on for an official episode where we're on camera. We can kind of talk um, very similar to when we met before, and we're definitely going to do this again. I want to do a couple of fun questions before I let you get about your busy day. And these I don't believe I got a chance to ask you last year at Reliable Plant. So just some fun questions. Number one, favorite music. Uh, my fa favorite music right now, and I like just about everything, but my fa favorite music right now is country. So I'm listening to a lot of country All right. um, and enjoying it. Good deal. Good deal. Next one is what is your favorite sport or hobby? And it doesn't necessarily have to be one in, in sports that you actually play. It might be one that you like to observe, or maybe even it's just going to be your favorite hobby. Well, I, I do, I do enjoy, you know, the common things, football, basketball, that sort of thing. But I think a hobby or, or something I'm really enjoying right now is uh, I, we recently got a side-by-side -side, uh, out there at the property and, and I'm figuring out how fast I can get from point A to point B and having a little fun with that. So I, I used to race in something called the Champ Car Series. Uh, and uh, so now I'm, I'm taking that energy instead of spending all that money on the weekends. I'm just playing around out there in the forest, but uh, it's still fun. It's something I definitely enjoy. Good stuff. Now this last one, no wrong answers here. What is your perspective and or philosophy on work-life balance? 
Oh, good one. Um, you know, for me, I, I think you you really have to figure out what is right for you. There, you know, if you enjoy what you do, then it's going to give you energy, and that's going to allow you to do things outside of work. Whereas if you hate what you do, everything you dedicate to it is taking energy away, which takes away from that time that you have outside. So I think, you know, the first question you got to ask yourself is, am I doing something I'm passionate about? Am I doing something I enjoy? And if so, you may do more of it because it gives you the energy to then carry forward uh, as you get home and spend time with the kids and, and the significant others. Yeah. I, 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 I love that. I mean, that's, that's why I always tell everybody there's no wrong answers here. Everybody's got something to offer and add and it's going to resonate with somebody. And it's like, it, there, there's no right answer. You just got to kind of figure it out. But these insights help people get ideas and go, Oh yeah, I kind of dig that. I'm kind of doing that. Or man, I should try that. I mean, I, I tell people schedule a half hour per week to go. I don't know. I'm in California. I say, I never go to the beach. I say, you should go to the beach half hour a week. Like, oh, how do you do that? And I'm like, do it, schedule it, make it happen. <laughs> Leave your phone in the car for 20, 30 minutes, man. It's it's brilliant. There's all kinds of strategies for this stuff. So uh, real quick now, uh, I know you've got the trade show coming up in May that you already mentioned. Do you expect to be at Reliable Plant out in Chicago in June? I do. So we've got a couple of good conferences coming up. If, if the listeners are going to the Marcon Conference at the University of Tennessee, uh, we're having a big 10th anniversary event there. We're going to spend some time up in the solar uh, sphere there at the World World's Fair Park uh, and have a good a good night there. So we're super excited about uh, the Marcon Conference. And then we do have Leading Reliability coming up and Reliable Plant coming up. So uh, we've got uh, a lot of uh, good uh, good times to meet people talk about specifically your situations, maybe we'll throw around the BS flag a little bit, right? So, uh, you know, if, if folks are going to be there, please come by and find us. Uh, we'd love to, to spend some time. We're passionate about this stuff. So we'd love to spend some time talking about your specific situation. Absolutely. And uh, out at Reliable Plant, I expect to be there and we've got some special stuff planned. So we'll be talking about that. Maybe we can find some time to sit down again. And we're going to do this again, too. And so, Number one, I want to I want to thank you for your time today, and I want to let people know you can find Iridicio at www.eruditio.com, and you can also get in touch with Sean. You can reach him at s Eisenhower. That's s i s e n h o u r at iridicio.com, and you're welcome to reach out to him directly. You can text him or you can call him at 843-810-4446. That way he can help you out with whatever you're working on. Even if it's a brief conversation, he'll probably point you in the right direction if he can't have his organization help you themselves. Sean, thank you for being on CMMS Radio again. Thank you, Greg. I've enjoyed it. Always fun. People are asking why I like FlowPath, facility management platform. With two decades in the industry and a successful CMMS exit of my own, I value FlowPath's user-friendly and adaptable solution. It's ideal for school districts, colleges, integrated facilities management companies, or multi-location maintenance environments. It's more than features. It's about the team, their approach, and real maintenance experiences that count. FlowPath delivers on its promises. They take care of their customers. Companies I know personally are thriving with FlowPath, Explore it yourself with a demo tailored for CMMS Radio listeners by clicking the link below. Did you find this episode helpful? Please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit CMMSradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.